meeting of the year. I want to start uh, the meeting with an acknowledgement from our sponsors. They're, re they're uh, responsible for the breakfast that, that you got and the refreshments. So I want to bring forth Grand Canyon University. Uh, good morning. On behalf of President Mueller, who many of you probably remember is a former high school teacher turned university president, um, and the 20, almost 23,000 students studying in class today, I uh, want to say thank you very much for the work that you all do. Um, you have lots of choices around the kind of ways that you spend your time and the career you chose. Uh, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the university for choosing to be educational leaders in an environment that's increasingly complex and challenging. So thank you very much for what you do. Please know how much we appreciate the opportunity to serve you. Um, most of you know that I serve on a team called K-12 Educational Development. Uh, we provide all kinds of comprehensive services to school districts, um, elementary, high school, whatever we can do to help you achieve your strategic priorities, we want to be able to do that. So whether it's professional development or parent outreach, student outreach, leadership support, uh, whatever you can think of, we can probably serve you in that capacity. So I would encourage you to think of us as a partner that can help you. Uh, we are very interested in being able to do so. On your tables, you'll find a packet of information. On the top, you'll see information related to a conference. Uh, GCU is partnering with ASA, the Arizona Business Education Coalition, and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office to provide a conference on school safety, security, and trauma-informed practice. Uh, we're going to have some great keynote speakers, including two superintendents who have survived mass shootings on their campus from Aztec, New Mexico, and Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, the Director of Homeland Security, Cindy McCain, a number of great people and then about a hundred different breakout sessions designed to provide really practical information for you. So please think about bringing teachers, administrators, um, your support staff like counselors or social workers, SROs, uh, parents, law enforcement is invited. We expect a great turnout and would love to have you join us. If you have any questions about the conference or anything else, uh, in the flyers that I've shared with you this morning, please feel free to reach out. I'll be here all morning and you all know how to reach me when I'm not here with you. So I'd like to introduce you to one of my colleagues from the admissions team, Eric Strong. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Eric Strong. I've been with GCU since 2003. I actually moved here from out of state to, to work here. And it's funny walking on campus, I think I saw maybe three students walking around and it was just a real sleepy Place. It's been really, really fun to watch the university grow, and it's become uh, a really awesome place to be. Uh, part of my responsibility is uh, I'm out in the school systems. I help staff who are looking to um, move forward with their education. Uh, a lot of administrators, education administration is one of our main programs. Uh, we offer most of our programs online, so you, uh, some of you may have seen me out in your schools. Um, I will continue to do that and be around doing that. And uh, just look forward to continue working with this school system. It's been really fun. There's another rep uh, that couldn't be here today. There's two of us that work with this system. Uh, Jennifer Collins, to see myself and her out there in schools. Thank you. Thank you, Grand Canyon University. Now I'd like to bring up our two, uh, our director, executive director, and our associate director from the State Board of Education, longtime friends of ASA, Alicia Williams and Catcher Baden, for an update on the State Board of Ed. Thanks, Mark. To both of us today. I'm just here to look pretty. Hey! I thought that was my job. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's broke this. So the big thing, uh, I know some of you may not be fans of the accountability system, that's okay. But I can say that the accountability system is now done until 21-22. 
And if you know what we've been doing since 2017, you know that every year we're creating it as the school year is going. So you mean we're going to have the same accountability system for more than one year? Yes. <laughs> I, I know. It's very exciting. Uh, well, just for traditional and Especially at a staff level, it's exciting. We're not running around trying to figure out an accountability system and then get it in front of the board um, last minute. With that, with the accountability system being done until the 21 22 school year, what we're hoping to do is match up any new accountability system with a new statewide assessment. Knowing full well that when you implement a new statewide assessment, you will see approved by the board prior to the 21 22 school year. Um, and so the Department of Education, as well as state board staff, is working on that currently. We're also looking at um, an accountability system for AOI schools, Arizona Online. Arizona online instruction, uh, which the State Board of Education oversees for district schools. Um, and then there is some talk about looking at middle schools, especially those schools with the makeup of seventh and eighth grade, um, to see if the accountability system is hurting those schools and if something needs to be done in order to ensure that those schools are, are able to access points. So. That's what we're doing right now. I see a clap up there for middle school. I appreciate it. Any questions? I, I have what, 10 minutes, right? Maybe. More or less. Does that, anyone have any we'll questions? We'll take the less. We'll take questions. <clears throat> this always happens when I come here. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, the accountability uh, system for uh, district AOIs, why not all AOIs? It, it would be for all AOIs. I was just saying the state board only um, has approval jurisdiction over district AOIs. Okay. So charter AOIs is through the charter. That would be for organizations like Prima Vera. Um, Prima Vera has actually been approved for an alternative school. They're not considered an AOI school. Do you have anything you want to say? Okay. Um, look for, uh, as you know, the potential legislation for Project Rocket comes to the State Board of Education. So if you're a school administrator who is currently overseeing a school that would um, fall into one of those categories, a letter grade of C with 60% for introduced lunch, a letter grade of B or a letter grade of F, or if you're a superintendent that has one of those schools in your district, um, look for an email from Mark um, because I need to start planning Project Rocket before the bill um, is passed and put into law so that we can roll it out by July 1st. And so with that, I'll be asking some people to come into our state board offices for some input. You're willing to do that for me. Which year's letter grade will apply to that Project Rocket? Um, it's yes. last year's, it's 1819. That's how they were able to determine the amount of funding. So. And you would have to elect to be in the program. It would be a three-year program. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. And to clarify that question, in case you didn't hear it, last year's the 1819 school grade that schools received, C, D, or F will be the one that will qualify or not qualify schools for Project Rocket. Again. Should that make it all the way through the sausage making process known as the Arizona legislature? So, I, before we move on uh, to our update from the Arizona Department of Education, I want to introduce a special guest we have with us today, uh, a person somewhat new to her position, but some of you might not have met her yet. We have the Arizona School Boards Association Executive Director with us today, Dr. Sheila Harrison-Williams. Make sure to welcome her. Okay, now we have with us two individuals from the Arizona Department of Education to uh, give us an update. We have Chief of, Chief of Staff, Claudio Coria, and we have the Legislative Liaison, Kelly Kozlak. Welcome. Well, good morning, buenos dias a todos. Good 
Uh, my name is Claudio, and uh, just uh, my friend, uh, my colleague, Callie, will introduce so briefly here. Uh, just a minute. Just wanted to send greetings from Superintendent Hoffman. She is in Southern Arizona this morning. Uh, can't be here this morning. Uh, visiting school, so really seeing the great work that's taking place across state. So just want to acknowledge her and the work that's being done. Uh, so I'm new to this position. I've been here two months. Uh, I think I still smell new. I feel like it. Um, New, this is two months since January I started here. Uh, just a little bit of background. So I'm a parent. I have uh, my wife and I have four kids. They're big kids now, but graduated, uh, went through the public system. Dice Art School District. Um, that's where I live now. Uh, I was a teacher. I was a bilingual teacher back in the late 90s. Uh, and then for the past about 20 or so years, I've been an administrator, uh, principal, middle school principal, high school principal, district level overseeing leadership development um, and, uh, and supervising principals, uh, Phoenix Union High School District. Um, I think it's also important to, to recognize the previous conversation around like the, the dynamics of the, our school accountability system and how sometimes that's so difficult and complex. So I, I share that with you to share that uh, we are very aware. I mean, Kathy has done a great job of uh, bringing in people who have school experience, understand the complexities of navigating large systems and, and the inherent in, uh, complexities and unfairness with the systems that we have. So we are very uh, aware and intentional about keeping that in mind in the work that we do. Uh, and so just wanted to share that for, both from a personal perspective as a parent of children in public schools, uh, as well as a professional just like you working in public schools. So that's really important to us. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us here. Again, my name is Callie Koslack. I lead the policy and government relations work for, for the agency. And um, I'm often over at the ledge with a lot of um, the folks that represent you all at the Capitol. And then what we'd like to do is just spend a few minutes here just doing some updates from the agency updates as well as legislative um, updates. And so the first one that I would think is on everybody's mind is the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so just wanted to just have a quick conversation about that. Uh, we are developing uh, guidance uh, right now at the department uh, for U.S. schools to think through that as you communicate with your staff, you probably already have, uh, with your stakeholders, your parents, and, and so forth. Uh, we want to be comprehensive about that. We have had a communication this morning, but uh, in light of the governor and Dr. Chris uh, conference this afternoon, we're going to hold off on sending that and make sure that the communication that we have, the guidance that we have, is is up to date as up to date as possible and then we'll, we'll share that with you i think dr george said sent out something last week from maricopa county health that that was very useful uh we also use that as part of our of our guidance uh, so that's really important just wanted to give a couple of uh, updates on that one here um again i've mentioned that uh, governor ducey and dr chris will have uh, a press conference this afternoon i think that was very useful for us i think the other thing is dr chris and department of health services will have a webinar on wednesday and uh, you should have received some communication about it already. If not, we will definitely put the specifics uh, on our communication to you. Uh, so again, it's going to be Wednesday from 2 to 3. It's a webinar, uh, and it's specifically geared for uh, schools and school districts and, and thinking about students and so forth. Uh, I know that uh, we've received calls from parents, from school folks, uh, such as you, around some guidance around that, some specific questions. Uh, I spoke with Dr. Chris on Friday just to get us up to date. And just let her know how important uh, that this is for our school leaders to have the up-to-date information with the right guidance. There's quest very complex questions around like school closures. Uh, we're seeing that in Japan. We're, we're, uh, we're hearing more, more about it. Uh, and I think this issue is not going away anytime soon. So the more prepared you are, the best. So we're, we're developing that. Uh, any, any initial questions about that? I have a couple more updates. Do you know when that communication will be coming from, from our department by the end of this afternoon, by the end of this, uh, close of business day, we'll send that out. Again, we want to wait for uh, Governor Newsom, Dr. Chris, just to make sure everything on there is up, up to date and then send that out. Good questions. Uh, and then um, a couple of things, uh, the retention and recruitment efforts. We know that of all the school improvement efforts out there, we know the one that's tried and true, and that is having the right adults, the right teachers in front of the kids, right? That's what matters. Everything else is important, but this is critical. So uh, we are supporting those efforts. Uh, we Did anybody attend the job fair, the big job fair this weekend, Saturday? I saw you there. Okay, you and your staff there. They did a great job, by the way. It was packed. 
we had uh, over 900 people registered and then 200 people show up, you know, independently. So we had a good turnout. Uh, I checked with most folks uh, and uh, they said they were getting some good quality applicants. I saw a couple of sheets, you know, they signed in. So a couple of sheets, uh, that, that, would be good, that would be a good sign. So I counted us to continue to support that work. Uh, folks in the southern part of Arizona, or if you want to, you know, go over there uh, and retention side, really working with you. Uh, there are some great work. There's some great work that's taking place in the districts right now. Uh, and so one of the pieces that I think is really productive that you're doing already is kind of a grow your own, right? Understanding that there's great people within your community and how do we help them to kind of, you know, level up, right? With that education, uh, with certification. And so continue to work with us in our department uh, to make this uh, a process a little bit smoother. You know the good people that you have in your community, let's, let's leverage them so that they are uh, providing that teaching support that you need. Can I answer that? Uh, and then uh, finally, just wanted to share with you from my end, and then I'll pass on to Kelly, uh, is that uh, we uh, we have just, uh, we have created a position post-secondary uh, coordinator, and this person is to connect with the work that you're doing around increasing access uh, and success in uh, post-secondary opportunities. I know you're like, I know that districts have been working on this for a while now. I know I have that experience. Um, but we as a department are now have invested in that to make sure that we're supporting the work that you're doing and, and supporting the, the transition of students who are leaving your system and then entering the post-secondary system. So we are committed to that. Uh, we're in the final stages of interviewing uh, some great folks and uh, we'll make a decision here shortly. So that's just another commitment that we have. And then I think uh, finally from my end here, uh, I shared this document here. It is a survey. Uh, I know I didn't have enough for everybody, but that's okay because I have it very useful. Uh, it's the, just two questions, two questions survey. People take two questions surveys. More than that, I'm not doing it, but two I can handle. Uh, and then there's technology too, right? There's a QR code, it works, I tried it. Uh, so if you'd like to give us some feedback, this is something that is really important to us, right? This, that's the right tone around like, we work for you. I think I shared this before, but unless I'm still new, so I don't know any different. Uh, but the way I see it, we work for you. Uh, and so getting your feedback and your perspective is really important to us. So please give us some feedback. Uh, I'll, I'll go around and pick it up. If you, when you finish it, the hard copy, send it to your right. Uh, and then I'll pick it up. And if not, the QR code works beautifully. We'll take that as well. Thank you, Claudio. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to do a quick run through of sort of the agency's work this legislative session um, and some of the bills that, that we're following in our budget request. Um, so just as kind of overall framework, I mean, when we think about um, policy and legislation and budgets from um, the agency perspective, we're, we're really trying to ensure that laws that are passed can be implemented by the agency and that we're able to operationalize them. So that's a strong lens that we use um, and also to ensure we have enough at, um, administrative funding to do the work that is um, laid out in new legislation. Um, we're also looking to support and get behind items that align with the superintendent's priorities, which are also, which are mainly driven by um, what she hears from, from the field, and to oppose items that do not align with um, the superintendent's agenda and for, could potentially cause harm to, to students, educators, and schools. For our budget request this year, um, some of our priorities included um, funding for our investigations <coughs> unit to, to try and limit the caseload. Um, our adult education program, we have a long waiting list every year um, of adults and disengaged youth who are interested in some of the certifications and um, the school finance payment system. Um, currently, that work is underway to modernize and replace the school finance payment system. It's a three-year project of $9 million, so we'll be going into the, the second year of it. Um, we're working closely with the Department of Administration on, um, on that project. Uh, we've also requested funding for our the ESA program um, to be able to administer it according to the law. And uh, we also requested school improvement dollars to uh, put more support behind our D schools. I think a lot of that school improvement effort this year will be funneled in through Project Rocket. Um, and the department is going, plans to work very closely with the state board on ensuring our, our federal level school improvement work aligns with a new state project around school improvement. Um, and we also had a request into our Office of Indian Education to provide statewide support across, um, across the 22 tribal nations. 
so the adult education investigation, school finance uh, payment system, and ESAs did get into other budgets, both the governor's and the, the Senate and House. So we look forward to seeing how, how that all shakes out. Um, some of the bills that, that we are supporting and have been involved with this session is um, HB 2684, which would create a crisis management team. Um, this is very specific um, to the Peach Springs School District. I think there have been um, many years of um, persistent underperformance, a lot of dynamic between local community and, and the school leadership and board there. Um, very unique situation. And so the, the crisis management team is designed to do a, a deeper fact-finding mission in order to provide, um, put, put forward some recommendations on a more state, sustainable plan for, for that community. Um, another bill we're supporting is um, HCR 2001, which would um, put the removal of the, the English only language on, on the ballot in November. Um, that, that seems to be stalled at the moment, but that's something we think is important because it really opens the door for more dual language opportunities across the state for all students. Um, we are also supporting um, SB 1060, which would increase group B weights for um, for special education funding. We work closely with um, a sort of interim committee um, that was working on kind of evaluating this. And we also work to ensure that some of the, the federal framework around special education funding would align with, um, with any uh, changes to the, to the state law. Uh, dyslexia is another um, bill that is moving through 1491. Um, this would create more support at the department to support around the implementation of the bill that was, was passed last year um, and for the department to provide support with the, the screening implementation that would be happening at the local level. Also supporting fourth year funding for CTEDS, um, gifted funding, hope to see the gifted funding be made ongoing so we're not having to go back to the legislature every year, um, create more stability for, for schools that are running gifted programs. Um, we are also supporting and worked closely with the sponsor on a bill um, that would, over three years, have $45 million going to preschool. Um, this is to restore some of the activities that were um, going on for the last five years under the, the preschool development grant from the federal government, which is now um, sunsetted, and unfortunately, this, um, Arizona did not um, get a renewal on that grant as anticipated, so some state dollars for preschool would go a long way in continuing that, that activity. So that's just a, sort of a, a snapshot of some of the things we're um, supporting. There's a few bills uh, that we're working on amendments for, including there was one on alternate testing for SPED, um, that there's going to be an amendment to make that into a study committee to look at how the state can better support um, teachers and the administration of um, alternate and regular assessments for kids with special education. Um, there is a bill, um, HB 2448, on innovation plans. That's another one where it's an interesting concept to, to provide more flexibility around seat time and, and other aspects of, but of, of sort of schools innovating and looking at competency-based learning models, but we just want to ensure it aligns with ADM administration and, and all that. Um, and then the school safety threat assessment one, this is another one where we want to ensure it aligns with a lot of the work that's already happening around the state um, so that it can be implemented successfully if it passes. Are there any, are there any questions? Thank you, Kelly, for your efforts. Um, my question is, when Arizona um, did not receive the preschool development grant as a state um, entity, did you follow up and find out why, why, why did you not receive it? And this is just looking forward. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, yes. Thank you, um, Superintendent Hightower. Um, we we did receive feedback about the. Um, so the question was on the the state's application for the federal preschool development grant funds. Um, we had a grant for four years at twenty million a year. Um, but we then had a planning grant after that in anticipation we would get another three years of funding um, to support a lot of that work. A lot of it was more systems level work, but it also did provide some preschool slots out to the, the field and high need areas. Um, so we did get some good feedback. Um, it was very competitive. Only 20 states did get 
did end up getting funding in this round, I think we could position ourselves better in the future. Um, some of the feedback was on alignment around state systems for, for, for preschool. I think the idea that there's it's sort of early child is happening in different pockets, but not sort of in a uniform way around um, around the state. So this is something I started um, talking with the governor's office about and, and some other agencies to see if we can find more alignment, including with first, first things first as well. Um, and, and also, I think part of the um, issue they saw too was there was no sustainable state funding or sort of skin in the game at the state level for preschool. So, so again, this legislation that would put some investment of state dollars into to preschool could, could help position us better in the future. I just have one more. So just as in closing, just want to thank all of you. Just want to acknowledge all the great work that you're doing across the state. On behalf of children, we acknowledge that. So thank you very much for that good work. Continue uh, this amazing work that you're doing. Count on us to be great partners with you. So I know there's superintendents here, principals, uh, university folks. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you do, uh, both on a personal level as a parent uh, of children, public schools, but also as a professional. So count on us to be great partners with you along this incredible work. Thank you. Thank you, Department of Education, Claudio and Callie. Now we're going to the legislature and on your behalf, and they are there literally morning, noon, and night. They have no life during the session. And that is a Capital Connection LC, Mark Barnes and Rebecca PB. And they are uh, promoting legislation and killing bad bills and equally successful in both. So Let's, let's give it up for Mark and Rebecca. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. Um, we're going to go over a PowerPoint that I put together Saturday night at 11 o'clock because I really have no life during this time and session. Um, and I know many of you. Um, so we wanted to present to the whole group today so that principals and higher ed and everybody could hear the legislative update at this point in the session. So we do have a legislative committee made, made up of mostly superintendents uh, who goes through the legislation that I send out or we meet in person to determine. And 1,581 bills introduced, three bills have been signed by the governor. Um, Friday afternoon, leadership was claiming that they'd reached a budget agreement. We're not so sure that died. Fillmore was not happy about that. All of his bills are dying, <laughs> um, whether in education or in other, um, right, or in other areas. And we've told them, you know, introduce better bills and then they won't die. Um, so 2015 is another Fillmore bill. It requires yes. districts um, review and approve all supplemental materials used in the classroom. Uh, he does not have the votes to get it forward, so he is not putting it to a um, third read vote. There was a couple uh, superintendents who reached out to their legislators to tell them that this is a huge problem. Um, so that was great that ASA and superintendents have that impact. Um, he asked us if we would let it pass out of the House so he could use it as a striker in the Senate on um, consolidation, and we said absolutely not. Um, so HCR 2036 and SCR 1007, I'm sure you saw a lot in the news about this. This was the ballot initiative that was a priority of the governor that um, specified that sanctuary cities, sanctuary jurisdictions are not allowed in Arizona and all cities, towns, <coughs> counties had to cooperate with law enforcement on immigration issues. One bill um, included political subdivisions, which would include districts. One did not. Um, the one that did not have political subdivisions amended in. Then they said they were going to take it back out. So they were going back and forth on that until finally they realized they did not have the votes. Um, we didn't like the bill because it included, because it was not a good good bill, and so because it included um, subdivisions which would cause some confusion in districts who um, so anyway so that they, they announced they didn't have the votes and they're not pursuing that anymore house bill 2119 i'm sure you saw a lot about this too this was um a udall bill related to transfers of, of credits um as you know right now when you take a credit from another school or an aoi you can assign it um, before they give a core credit to a credit that's transferred and require a final exam. Um, Representative Udall's bill said that if the 
class that they took that they're transferring in had an in-person final exam, then the district had to accept it as core credit. Uh, what she was trying to do, she, she just came up with this idea on her own as an Algebra 1 teacher. She says she sees a lot of people who go and take um, Algebra 1. They fail it in school and go and take it online and then are not prepared for the next year of math. So she was trying to do something to help us. Um, I told her we prefer status quo, where we can give our own end of course assessments to anybody transferring, trying to transfer in core credits. Um, and the, the AOIs did not like the bill. They did not want um, to administer in person. She did all last summer. I know some of you attended those. We, we went to about 40 or 50 last summer. So I'm not, not super excited about that, but it's better than the bill getting through. Um, House Bill 2367, I called several of you at the last minute for some help on this bill as well. This is for Representative Dunn um, the Yuma area. He wanted to put in statute that when a student enrolls in school, the parent has to provide verifiable documentation of legal custody. Uh, we weren't entirely sure what he was trying to get at with that, but we said it was, um, you know, we didn't know what that meant and it was an administrative burden and the enrollment process right now is pretty clear and working for everyone. Um, so he was going to hold the bill and not move it forward, but he decided to amend that provision out and just run a bill that, I'm sorry, Callie, that moves, that Callie and I have been working on this, that moves the um, enrollment guidelines that have to be adopted from the department to the State Board of Education. Sorry, catcher, at least you do. I tried. <laughs> So um, he's claiming, he and Representative Udall are claiming that the enrollment um, guidelines are not clear and that they've been changing. You know, we tried to explain to them that they haven't. Um, they just have a different viewpoint. So that that passed the House of Representatives on a party line vote. Um, there's some weird, weird stuff going on with that. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, 1503, the Legislative Committee looked over this in depth. It's um, what, what Representative Boyer is trying to do is ban electronic communication between students and employees of a school district. Um, the bill was pretty long and lengthy, and um, when we looked at it as a Legislative Committee, we had to, we had to um, work with... It was bad, with, just say it. It was bad. <laughs> well, it was confusing, and um, most of our districts have already adopted these policies and we don't think a state law will prevent, unfortunately prevent somebody from engaging in grooming behaviors with a student. It's just an unfortunate um, thing, especially with technology now. But we worked on a floor amendment with the state board and with ASBA to clarify the difference between school technology and personal technology to ensure that teachers can use their personal phone or personal laptop so long as they are accessing a district approved platform like their email or something like that or even like a classroom website that they've set up so long as the district is aware um, that it exists 1357 this one was a pain as well um kate brophy mcgee voted no on this committee when which was good we did not like this bill she was planning on voting for it we had three superintendents reach out to her um, and she said, I have to, you know, I'm going to vote for it in committee, but I'm going to help you with before it gets to the floor. And when it got to committee, some teachers testified and they did a really good job explaining why. Um, what the bill did is it required all instructional material to be approved by the district governing board 90 days before the school year. And the way the definition was written, it included websites, worksheets, um, anything that a teacher uses in the classroom. So an AP history teacher went up there and showed all the primary sources documents she uses and they just did a really good job testifying um, on why the bill is problematic and our superintendents reached out to her she voted no and helped us work on a floor amendment um, that specifies it kind of clarifies the language around um, parents being able to because there's a statute that already exists where parents can request to review textbooks and curriculum um, so it clarifies that and then it does require that districts post on their website the district approved textbooks that they're using. Many districts are already doing this. I know <coughs> Scottsdale is, Cave Creek does, Mesa does. I don't wanna keep pointing out just, but a lot of districts do, but that would just be the <coughs> textbooks that are approved and adopted by the board, um, which is way better than what the bill originally was. And that's thanks to the Democratic Caucus and Senator Pace, um, who is in the Mesa area, and Senator Brophy McGee really helped with that. <laughs> Don't exit out. Can we get some help with the PowerPoint? Right here. Don't 
Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, problem bills that are still moving. Callie mentioned this one, House Bill 2089, School Safety Threat Assessment Teams. It's from Representative Kavanaugh. It requires every school district adopt a threat assessment um, protocol. Uh, it's, it's, he just took the language from something he saw in the newspaper in Virginia, so it doesn't really work. And I went um, and met with him and told him superintendents are you know, supportive of the concept of threat assessments, but the way this is written really doesn't work. This needs some major work, and it doesn't include charter schools. And I was hoping that would stop the bill, but he amended charter schools in, which we were pretty surprised by in education committee. Um, we were able to hold this bill from the, it, it kept showing up on a final read calendar and it didn't have the votes to pass. We were able to get it retained four times. <coughs> and then unfortunately, just last Wednesday, it, um, it passed, it just barely, it passed on, it was party line, right? Yeah, because Campbell switched. So it passed on a party line vote. I mean, it's a big, it's a big mandate on districts. Um, I know Callie last week, you said you guys had some concerns about it. Um, so that's something we're gonna to have to keep working on more seriously now that it got to the, is going to the Senate. I believe Debbie called Representative Campbell. Thank you, that was awesome. He held his vote for four days. He told him he wasn't gonna vote for it. And then on the fifth day, they twisted his arm and he, he I, gave in. I tried Pierce too, but I cannot get him to respond. Yeah, I think Tim Carter also reached out to Pierce. And so. So they listen to us, but then they get their arm twisted and they're told all your other bills are going to die if you don't vote for this. So uh, 2128 is still moving. It hasn't gone to a floor vote in the House. This requires um, the Board of Regents and the Department of Ed to coordinate fall and spring break so they match. Um, year round school districts are exempt from this. The universities obviously opposed this. We opposed this. It died in committee, and the sponsor was there and was very upset that they killed his bill. So we had them reconsider it, passed out of committee. It doesn't have the votes right now um, to pass on the floor. But if you're looking for something to talk to your legislator about today, if you want to send off an email, 2128 would be a great one to tell them this doesn't work. I mean, I, a lot of legislators simply don't like it, but they would probably like to have the support of their local superintendent. So when they vote, they can say this just this just doesn't work. Um, 2829, I just got a question about this one. This is a bill from Representative Grantham. It's very strange. I don't, a lot of you know the Education Lorax. I can't remember his name, the guy that wears the orange shirt. I'm looking at you, Debbie, because sometimes you're at the state board. You know him. The oh, guy, the recess yeah. guy. No, uh, not uh, him. Uh, he he shows up and he introduces himself as the education board. Right. Yeah, he's into charter school accountability. Um, and so he ran this. Joe, Joe, Joe. Joe? Joe, Joe. Joe. Joe Lorax. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Lorax. Um, so he ran this bill with Representative Grantham, who is a conservative from LD12, where there's a lot of charter schools. So it's kind of weird. I don't know if he knew what he was getting into. Um, LD12 is the Gilbert, Queen Creek area. Uh, so it requires schools and charters give an annual financial statement to their teachers that has all their medical benefits, their retirement benefits, their social security paid, all of that. Um, I signed in, nobody else did anything on it. I signed in neutral saying it was an administrative burden. Um, I would think the charters really wouldn't like this bill. So waiting to see what they do when it gets to Senate education um, with Sylvia Allen, they can usually get her to listen to them. Um, I mean, teachers can get that information now. So um, uh, civil liability gun-free zones, this is a really bad bill. This specifies that any gun-free zone can be found liable if there is a, if somebody is harmed in a gun-free zone and believes that the possession of a gun could have prevented their injury, um, it holds the gun-free zone civilly liable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So schools would schools would fall under this. It doesn't have the votes right now. He's pushing it hard. The universities are included in this and are very opposed. Um, you know, we talked with Representative Carter or Senator Carter and Senator Kate Brophy McGee, and they said there's no way they're voting for it. Um, so if we can, you know, thank them, show them support, and get some of our other legislators to understand. It's not on a calendar for today because they don't have the votes. So we'll see how hard Gallon keeps pushing that. 
Uh, Callie mentioned this next bill, 2648, alternative testing exemption. Um, I believe that amendment was adopted on the floor last week that establishes the study committee um, to, to study uh, assessments for kids with special needs. The superintendent is listed as someone who would sit on that study committee. Um, college credit by examination, uh, 2438. ASA is not a fan of the college credit and I can never remember what it's called, College Credit by Examination Incentive Program, which provides the bonus to teachers with um, AP and IB when they get, when their student gets a passing score that generates money for the teacher. This bill appropriates an additional million dollars to the incentive funding because they were two or three million short last year and they had to prorate down the bonuses. Um, it also appropriates a million and a half to the development fund, which was created last year to um, offset the cost of the exam fees for students and to cover PD and other um, costs incurred that a school district incurs to offer AP. So we told the sponsor and the committee that we support, um, we oppose the incentive funding and the bonuses, and we support uh, the money that's going into the development fund and the concept of a development fund. So they believe that they have appropriated enough to cover the test fees um, for students, for low-income students across the state. I don't, there wouldn't be much left over for PD or materials or anything. Um, that passed out of the House, and, and there's Democrats, um, particularly the Democrats on the Education Committee, really don't like this program. They don't, they see it as, like we do, they see it as results-based funding for, um, for college credit uh, programs. So that passed out of the House on a party line vote. <clears throat> Sorry, am I taking too much time? No, no. I mean, just... So if you take note of any of these numbers, you talk to your legislators, these are good bills to talk to them about. What about, Mark, is it, could we get a fiscal note attached to Brett's estimate? Uh, we could ask for that, yeah. They would call us and ask us. They so would what ask you're us. saying, though, is these are bills that we would like to stop. So if you want to send any legislators emails, these are the ones to say, hey, we don't like this. Yeah, I think 2648, we, we didn't sign and opposed on that because the department was taking the lead on that and hopefully it moves forward as a study committee. Um, but certainly, if it doesn't, it's, it's, it doesn't work. But yes, Mark. 2089 has personnel we don't have in time. Right. Yeah, it, it would be. Okay. All right, I'm going to the next slide. Yeah, so then these are just other bills to know. There's a, a Cook bill that specifies that um, school districts can't prohibit students from wearing cultural regalia at graduation ceremonies. Bowie has a bill that says the department has to um, adopt rules to allow mental health to be a uh, mental health day to be considered an excused absence. We told him he didn't need the bill and, and you could already call, you know, a parent could call in and take a sick day, you know, for their child and for a mental health issue. Um, so they really wanted the bill, so that. So um, a suggestion might be um, for the bills that you want us to write emails to, I can help, or if anyone wants to, could you refer, or, you know, we need some talking points on that. So. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll probably, if we do that, we'd target one or two bills. Um, That's fine. Yeah. Once you want the mass, you know, the masses to get the legislators, then we just focus on We can do that, would just help with the, uh, you could just send, like, you know, here's a couple, just for consistency, and if you want us to say just a couple talking points, yeah. we can sign on to it. I think that's a great idea, but I also think, um, and, and when I. They can do that there. Say the question again. The question. Oh. It's more of a statement that on if you are asking for us as um, leaders to send our legislators um, statements or a support or what have you, that if ASA could write up the talking points or just for consistency, you can just generate those and send them on our behalf. Sure. Um, and what I did mention when you guys reached out to Kate is it is more meaningful when it's not mass. Sorry mass, you know, so they don't all get the same three talking points from 10 superintendents and principals to tweak it. And I saw what you guys said. It was great to tweak it more to your district. So they don't feel like it's just a mass email that 
but we could use your bullets yeah. to customize. There's okay. so many bills. Right. Sometimes we're, we can use which ones we're talking about. So if you have like the first two talking points and then you say the third one, uh, make it fit into your story, like you kind of did with the other one, that, that worked really well. Which is that these are the two that have got to be in there and then how it impacts, you know, Humboldt or Washington or something like that. So, okay. And then we can uh, do the impact, the impact is where we really affect the patient. Yeah. And, and many okay. of us have their cell phones and so we text them rather than, we tend to hear back from the ones we text, not the ones who we just have their email. Yeah. So that we can be brief and what do you know? Uh, so can I can I keep going? Go okay. Senate Bill 1444, I covered 1446 is another Bowie bill. It requires um, at the high school level any school that issues student ID cards to print a national suicide prevention number on that. Um, just when you issue when you create and issue the new ID. So it's not uh, yeah, and that's why. I couldn't, we couldn't oppose it because he said, you're anonymous. already doing this. So 1587 is a case out of bill. He's introduced for several years. I was shocked to see it on a Senate education agenda last week. Um, it's his unpaid school meal fees bill that he run in the past. That's very long um, and, and includes prohibitions on. Um, so what got the committee was a prohibition on school districts serving an alternative meal to students who cannot pay, um, a prohibition on requiring chores or any um, discipline action on a student who has a negative meal balance, and a prohibition on treating them differently than other students. Um, Rebecca, do we know who he thinks is even doing this? No. No, I can't. Yeah. No, it does not address that. Basically, it's feed them and pay for it, and no, you don't get any money. Figure it out. Quinn. So just to put it in context, we're up to $200,000 right now. Current for a million. Yeah, um, we've worked on this bill in the past, and it's not, it's going to be hard for him to get it to the finish line because I think a lot of legislators see that, and we also have conservative, more conservative legislators who don't think schools should be feeding kids at all. There should be no national school lunch program on our campuses. Um, so for him to get that across the finish line would be a big lift. Uh, again, I was shocked to see it on an agenda. It hasn't gone to a floor vote yet, um, so we'll see. We'll see where that goes, and if it really starts moving, we'll engage more on that. That just went through last week. Um, so the governor's two priority bills I put on here just so everybody is aware outside of the legislative committee. Um, 2625 requires schools um, dedicate September 25th of each year to civics education. 1356 raises the passing score on the civics exam to 70 and it allows 7th and 8th graders to take the test to meet the requirement. Um, here's a, this is a list of bills ASA supports. Um, but I want to make sure Mark has time to cover some of the funding things. So I. What was that last one? For the test? Oh, yeah. I don't remember the bill number. 1356. Okay. And these are both the gov Governor Deuce's priorities. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca, for being here. Next slide. Uh, I want to cover a couple of, a couple of funding issues. Um, You'll see my story is not as rectified as you know sometimes. Um, I'm going to cover three. three okay, there we go. You can answer a question. No. no. Yeah, we're taking a picture. Okay. So, three funding issues that are being um, discussed with the legislature. And they're all in the form of bills that are moving along in, in some fashion or another. Uh, first one is Project Rocket um, Project. Um, uh, districts that qualify, schools that qualify are in three categories. Um, uh, a, C, a C school with 60% or more um, participation in school, reduced price lunch program, D and F schools. There's a little bit different criteria depending on where the school falls in those different categories. Um, Alicia I covered some other aspects of it. Um, I'll move on to uh, special education funding, uh, Senate Bill 1060. 
Callie covered this a little bit, but this is a, this is a result of our work with Senator Allen by a, a number of different groups. And what the bill does at this point is it, it comes a $56 million bill. Um, it funds the extraordinary special needs fund that schools can, can uh, apply for funding from if they've got a student that they're educating. And the cost of that special ed student is three times that of the average funding for for a, a pupil in our in our Arizona system. Uh, it's funded at five million dollars. The other part of the bill is a permanent change in the Group B weight uh, for the um, specific learning disabilities, speech language impairment, and other health impairments. Weight is at 0 .003 weight right now. That generates about thirteen dollars per student and twelve dollars per student. As increased in the legislation to uh, 0.12 or 0.114, resulting in about $501 allocation for students in this category. It's a permanent law change, so it costs the state about $49 million this year and about that much or more each 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 uh, of the next year. So it's a permanent change in statute. Uh, there's a couple other the, there's a couple other things in the bill. One is that the fund, the extraordinary needs fund, can be used to pay for independent education evaluations. If the uh, parent asks for that, you can ask for uh, reimbursement through that fund. And then a, a, a very large bill, the school facilities board. Uh, there is over the summer there was a lot of work done related to what could be done at the school facilities board and reform it. And that discussion. Um, resulted in a number of things. One is that the, the some members of the legislature thought it just couldn't be reformed and had to be replaced in a way. And so uh, House Bill 2629 basically transfers the functions of the school facilities board to the Arizona Department of Administration. So all the authority, powers, duties of the school facilities board goes over to the State Department of Administration. And then there is a school facilities board oversight board within the Department of Administration that's formed and is responsible of, in and uh, coming up with some some policies that are some of them are aimed at better communication between this area of state government and school districts like required time frames on correspondence and replies back to districts things like that and then it creates a school capital assistance fund with a per student distribution it, it, it out appropriates 40 million dollars and then account allocates that 40 million dollars to just district schools based on their weighted student count. Um, uh, amounts to about $35 per student that's allocated to districts. And then districts can use that, that money to take care of minor repairs, replacement, some infrastructure needs. And then um, the building renewal grant program still exists and is and, uh, $60 million appropriated to it under this legislation. Districts can still tap that to do some of the more major repairs on their facilities. Um, there's some some things in the bill like in order to apply for the building renewal grant program the repair or the application for that whatever that thing is the application relates to has to be um, enough that it couldn't be covered with 50 percent of the allocation from the uh, school capital assistance fund um, there is a, a fairly large the, the, the legislators running this bill want input from districts and we've given them some in, in, input. They are having a sort of a, um, a meeting we put together with ASBOA, ASBOA and ASBA's help on Thursday, where some of the districts are going to come together with Andy Tobin, the director of the Department of Administration, and Representative Udall to make sure this legislation is hitting the mark and is resolving the bulk of the issues that districts have with the school facilities board. Uh, that sort of concludes what I wanted to cover. Happy to answer any questions if there's time. Good question on the details in that. If it has to be more than 50% of an allocation, um, do we have any idea how that would be structured? If you have multiple campuses that all have $300,000 worth of roofing projects, and that $300,000 doesn't meet, typically it's a single, single grant for each site. I think it's done by the allocation, I believe it's done by district. So pretty large district, Brian. So let's say you receive $600,000 through the allocation. You've got an application in for under 300,000. Probably they would say, no, it has to be at least 50% of your, of your 
of your capital, of your school capital assistance fund allocation. You know so if it was a three hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollar it's a problem. Well, that's a problem. Yeah. Right. If I have yeah. five or six sites that need two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of work. And this, the sponsor knows no, I think that. It's, but it's if you consolidate, I don't know. If you consolidate those. Well, so this spot. Right? Yeah. The sponsor uh, knows that's an issue. Yeah, she thinks that the sponsor represent you all thinks that we need to look at this. She called the threshold as a threshold and figure out how you know how it's managed. And that's part of the you know conversation Thursday morning. Yeah, so I'm just asking that. if you can take that forward as part of the conversation. We, I that's spoke to her about that briefly in the lobby, and she was like, "Yeah, we just we need to get something in there." But I know that's an issue, so I expect to make it be taken. Out. I expect that that would get addressed because you're right. The, the way you're seeing it is the way we're reading it. Okay. Jeff? Grants that are still in the, going through a project, are they still, there's going to be any hiccups in those projects that are already in the process of approval? Jeff asked if projects that there that people currently have applications requests in, what's going to happen? I know that the, they, they're, the school facilities board under the department administration's director Andy Tobin functioning as the director, they put a bunch of the backlog ones on the agenda I think morning of what happened. What's the disposition of current projects? Yeah. So. Um, I heard that this, the Ruby uh, weight, so one of the budgets had uh, cut it in half. Do you know where it's at or where, where the sausage making is at? Uh, Chris, what we've, what we've heard is it's, <laughs> the, the folks that aren't supposed to tell us details described it that this way, they said it's trending well, and um, so and so it's this. That's you know, it's, a, it's a fifty-six million dollar proposal, and what may be holding it up is it is got a one-time ask for five million or six million, and it's got a 50, 50 million and uh, ongoing appropriation, and that's probably creating a little bit of a drag on it. But it's, um, I think it's if the Senate has their way more than the House, it'll. Where, where does the referendum uh, on uh, uh, sales tax increase stand? It's in the Senate, and it doesn't have the votes right now. Um, in committee, I believe it was Alan said, tell me if you're going to vote for this or not. Um, and Senator Gray said, I'm not voting for it. Um, they have a 17-13 split in the Senate. So, I mean, I guess to answer your question, Alan is counting her votes and she doesn't seem to have them at the moment, but it's still Alan and Brooke and Iggy are working on it. So, I think it was actually Brooke and Iggy who said, if you're not going to vote for this, tell me. And Senator Ray said, I'm not going to vote for it. So, that's where it okay. is. Stuck in the process. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your time. As you can see, lots of issues there, and, and we've got two people well on top of it, and they also work very well with the our State Board of Ed and our Arizona Department of Ed um, people. Okay, a couple other things here. I'll show you a lot of different events coming up. The Carolyn Warner Women in Leadership Conference is pretty well fully booked. If you register now, you may or may not get the um, Fran Perlman, Dr. Perlman's free book, but uh, I think we still have one or two spots open. Superintendent's Professional Day, April 16th on cybersecurity. That's a whole day on cybersecurity issues. That's at West Mech in Glendale. Thanks, Greg. Then the, the APEL Higher Ed Drive-In Conference, May 1st. And you see the banner up to my left, your right, the Summit on School Safety, Security, and Trauma-Informed Practices, May 7th and 8th. And uh, Dr. Jennifer Johnson talked about that. The Institute for Excellence, the end of May, our summer conference in June. Now, one other thing to take a look at here. The division meetings. You see those rooms? I don't need to read them off to you. You can read. Then elections, these are the candidates coming up. The, you'll receive a, a ballot in a couple weeks. Uh, ASA president-elect uh, running for that office is Dr. Lupita Hightower. And there she is. 
Running for Secretary Treasurer of ASA, Joetta Gonzalez. I don't think I saw Joetta here today. Casa Grande Elementary Superintendent. Running for president elect of the elementary division, and, and he is here today, Principal Andy Gutierrez from Creighton Elementary. There he is. <laughs> Running for president elect of the El educational services division. I don't know if I saw Eric here today. Eric Dupin from Chief Academic Officer from Creighton Elementary. Secretary Treasurer Drew is here today of the Ed Services Division, Assistant Soup and Buckeye L. There he is, Drew Davis. Secretary Treasurer of Elementary Division, yet to be determined. Superintendent's Division, the bottom left there. President-elect running for that is Dan Streeter, superintendent right now of Humboldt Unified, soon to be superintendent of the Marana Unified School District. Dan Streeter. Secretary Treasurer of the Superintendent's Division, Stephen Estatico, and he's right up front here. <laughs> Superintendent of Superior Unified. Secondary Division, running for President-elect, Brian Mapp, and he's back about the middle of the room, and Brian is Casa Grande Union High School District. He's the principal. And finally, no picture, but someone who's been in ASA a long time, and he's the principal of Peoria High School in the Peoria Unified School District, Paul Bauer. And he's back here. Thank you, Paul. So those are the candidates, and uh, you will be getting a ballot sent to you in about um, right around the middle of March, and we'll you'll have uh, several weeks to fill that out. Let me show you once more the rooms for the division meeting. There they are, in case you weren't quick enough to see those. And they will start in five minutes, five minutes to get to the division meetings. State Board and Department of Ed, thank you for being with us today.